Aaron Dykes here for TrueStreamMedia.com. Now, obviously, you've heard about the biggest story in the country over this illegal immigration issue and the humanitarian crisis of all these children showing up from Central America, places like El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, on the doorstep of America with border security unable to do anything with them, with not enough places to put them, with their status up in question, with accusations that Obama's administration told them they could come here and stay. What do you think about Barack Obama? He's helping us. He signed papers and said all Guatemalans who come to the United States can stay. He's giving us permission. And all this on the backs of the larger immigration issue of tens of millions of illegal people in the country looking for amnesty and of course, the Democrats, the Obama administration, want to pass the DREAM Act. But the Republicans have been backing immigration reform as well, all the way back to the Bush administration. Jeb Bush, the brother of the President George W. Bush, wrote the policy for the Council on Foreign Relations. I'm going to say this and it'll be on tape and so be it. Uh, the way I look at this is someone who comes to our country because they couldn't come legally. Yes, they broke the law. But it's not a felony. It's an act of love. It's an act of commitment to your family. Both sides of the aisle are ready to make a deal on immigration, and it's only going to hurt America. But this is about more than just the they took our jobs mantra, which is true and valid. But we're dealing with a much more complex issue. We're dealing with immigration under the larger auspices of free trade, of globalization. Let's look at what's really going on with this because we've got bankers, capitalists, globalists, and entities that are international in scope who are looking to, quote, leverage human capital migrants across borders and they're reshaping and re-leveling world order through this process. Yes, there is a fear of globalization. There's a fear that if you open borders, that in some way it is threatening globalization, therefore, particularly in the human movement area, the area of migration, is going to continue to cause uh, tension and pressure. The timing of this humanitarian crisis at the border cannot be missed. Are you being led by the emotional issue of children being at the border? Are you thinking in terms of there's a political deal going on in Washington that's supposed to be happening now? Why are these things happening at this time? That's why we're seeing headlines like House Homeland Security Chair. There's a crisis like nothing I've ever seen at the border. The issue has been going on for some time. You had Pelosi going down to the South Texas border saying, let's make this crisis an opportunity. We're all Americans just with a border between this us. This is a community with a border going through it. And this crisis that some call it crisis we have to view as an opportunity. While Obama is being told he should use his executive power to create a new refugee program to take care of these children and let other new people into the country. I'm beginning a new effort to fix as much of our immigration system as I can on my own, without Congress. I don't prefer taking administrative action. I take executive action only when we have a serious problem and Congress chooses to do nothing but through emergency powers and through international coordination they're talking about quote stepping up deportations which may happen in numbers but in terms of overall people coming into the country it won't curb those numbers they're going to increase deportations by justifying opening up those famous fema centers the emergency centers set up for the number one crisis on the books since the 80s immigration a flash of illegal immigration that's the whole purpose for those fema authorized emergency camps that you've heard about oh there's other reasons too for the dissidents and what have you obama says if he were going to opt for a refugee program he'd likely use his own authority to create it rather than going to congress and he's now saying he's going to use everything in his executive power they're talking about a quick legal avenue to take care of refugee children who are endangered while at the same time stemming the tide of illegal immigration. Give me a break. No one buys that stuff. What is going to happen is what Refugee Council of the USA Christian Astor is talking about, 
an in-country and regional processing center that basically would happen in the U.S., but also in the Central American countries. And they would bring in the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees who could get involved in the coordination of this refugee program, given that the children from Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras may have to flee their native countries quickly because they're so dangerous. The Commissioner of Refugees for the United Nations, Antonio Guerras, he's been to Bilderberg, and so have other key United Nations people. They want to expand the international authority for dealing with this immigration issue, and we're going to see very quickly why. But all this rhetoric about immigration is really just about expanding authority. And all it's going to do is debase this country a little bit more, a little bit more. What happened in Roman history? Rome was overwhelmed from within when it was taken over from the tribal gangs that infiltrated the actual city because the empire had overexpanded and been unable to protect its borders, its roads, and eventually its very inner territory. That's what's happening with immigration. But when the U.S. falls, when it slowly declines and can no longer protect itself, it will be the globalist corporatist financiers and bankers who will pick up the pieces and control everything. What may come as a surprise to some or just be common sense to others is that NAFTA and other free trade agreements have been the primary drivers of large scales of illegal immigration. Since 1994, when NAFTA went into effect, more and more workers in Mexico have been displaced and forced to move up into the country. Since 2006, the CAFTA agreements that affect Central America and the free trade with the United States have forced similar proportions of workers from Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, and other countries in the region up to the United States because their jobs are being destroyed. Why is that? We were told NAFTA was going to curb illegal immigration. We were told it was going to raise wages for workers on all sides of each border in Canada, the United States, and Mexico. We were told it was going to create factory jobs in Mexico that were going to give them stable and better employment. But it was all a lie. You remember Al Gore saying NAFTA is a good deal. Now this is a good deal for our country, Larry, and let me explain why. This is a good deal. And Ross Perot warning about that giant sucking sound. $14 an hour for factory workers. And you can move your factory south to the border, pay a dollar an hour for labor, hire a young 25. That's assume you've been in business for a long time. You've got a mature workforce. And you don't care about anything but making money. There will be a giant sucking sound going south. But it wasn't just that factories were going to move to Mexico for the cheaper labor. That was just one part of the phase. They moved on to Central America, where there were even cheaper wages, and of course to China, where there were rock-bottom wages and other Asian countries. And that has displaced a whole bunch of workers. In particular, the effects of NAFTA on illegal immigration have displaced about 2 million Mexican jobs. Here's a fact sheet from witnessforpeace.org and they've got all their statistics cited. Mexicans and Central Americans were told they would have increases in trade, foreign direct investment, and exports that would raise incomes and their standard of livings. These agreements were supposed to reduce migration and create more and better jobs, as well as reduce prices for goods. Obviously, they were promised a little bit too much. It sounds a little too good to be true. What actually happened is that millions of jobs were made obsolete by cheap imports from the United States to Mexico and then later to Central America that left many of those workers no choice but to migrate north and look for work. That doesn't mean you have to accept all the illegal immigrants, but you should at least realize where they're coming from and why they were put in that position. Since NAFTA started in 94, the number of Mexican migrants entering the U.S. more than doubled from 235 to over half a million. You can see on the chart how illegal immigration was already high, but went straight up in a spike after the passage of NAFTA. One of the major drivers of this was U.S. subsidies for agriculture. More than $20 billion put into mainly corn and soy, benefiting companies like Archer Daniels Midland, Cargill, ConAgra, Monsanto, and the rest of biotech, 
made really cheap corn that they dumped on the Mexican market and it put millions and millions of Mexican workers out of business because their corn could no longer be sold in a competitive market and it made them go look for other jobs. But that was supposed to be okay because they were supposed to get factory jobs. But again, those production jobs didn't stay there. They didn't create enough jobs to sustain the Mexican workers who were put out of jobs or the new ones entering the workforce. They moved on to the cheaper wage countries and forced more than 2 million agriculture workers from Mexican farms to go north looking for jobs in the U.S. And it creates an unsustainable thing where there's highly exploited, low-wage Mexican workers living illegally in the U.S., giving benefit mainly to multinational corporations, benefiting from the cheap labor, and hurting more and more progressively Americans, their standard of living. At the same time, firms like Walmart in particular and other multinational-backed firms were allowed through free trade agreements to move into Mexico and then later into Central America, bringing cheap goods and cheap jobs to the region that totally disrupted mom-and-pop businesses, medium-sized small businesses, and really independent businesses of all kinds. More than 30,000 Mexican businesses were forced to shut down and driven out of the country, creating even more unemployed workers who would go north and bringing in Walmart and other similar companies' brand of soft tyranny, of corporate dominance, repaving over Mexico and redeveloping it. Walmart is now dominant in Mexico's economy. They have more than 2,000 stores open and they're the biggest employer as well as the biggest retailer in the entire country. CAFTA, by a similar token, increased dramatically the levels of unemployment and put a lot of people out of work in the Central American countries, the five countries that were bullied into the agreement. They lost their jobs, and so they're looking for work moving through Mexico and into the United States. That's at a backdrop of the total disparity, the total disruption of life that happened in Central America as a byproduct of U.S. foreign policy because of all the civil wars that the U.S. was covertly backing and not so covertly backing. Since World War II, the U.S. rebuilt the destroyed Europe plane with the reconstruction loans and the rebuilding through the cooperative economic development in Europe. Afterwards, they rebuilt the rest of the world under the auspices of the Cold War. The Cold War between the U.S. and Russia didn't go hot. It went to proxy wars in the rest of the world, creating coups, revolutions, civil wars, and wars backed by the U.S. and Russia that devastated millions upon millions of lives, kicked out leaders, and disrupted economies. One of the most hard-hit places was Central America. There's a prolonged civil war in El Salvador. There was the backing of the Contras in Nicaragua, which affected Honduras. All these countries were interconnected, and a lot of people had their lives disrupted, and things have really never been the same. Now they're being corporatized, and those who are still working in agriculture sectors, those who had subsistence jobs, are now being driven out of barely getting by and forced to go north just to survive. But is all this upsetting to the powers that be? No. They actually want this form of disruption under free trade. They say this is competitiveness. They say it's a necessary shift in the workforce. They say that migration, including illegal immigration, is a necessary component of the New World Order's free trade globalized economy. But I can understand that globalization, therefore, particularly in the human movement area, the area of migration, is going to continue to cause uh, tension and pressure and therefore we have to react in advance by explaining the positive benefits. This is the heart of globalization. Sure, it's upsetting in the short term, but in the long term, it's supposed to be better for everyone. You tell me, are we headed there? Let's talk about Peter Sutherland, the consummate Bilderberger, the guy who's on the steering committee. He was in charge of GATT, the General Agreement for Tariffs and Treaties. He was their last major director and the first director of the WTO, the World Trade Organization. He's been called the father of globalization, and he's very much consciously behind what's happening with everything under globalization and the remaking of American world order, including illegal immigration. 
Meet the man who will be in charge of the UN takeover of America. An article from Dave Hodges that's right on. Peter Sutherland is not only the consummate Bilderberger and the father of globalization, he's also the United Nations head commissioner for migration. He's in charge of the United Nations policy, which is coordinated with hundreds of other countries for the entire world. And he's also the non-executive chairman of Goldman Sachs International. And Dave Hodges makes a lot of parallels to what's going on with the current humanitarian, very convenient crisis on the border with these children showing up from Central America and what the larger plan is. Just why the children, he asks. The same day on my website, I published an article which contained an advertisement by the U.S. government for escorts to help illegal immigrant children who are going to be illegally crossing the border. In other words, the immigration crisis was planned at least seven months in advance by the U.S. government. A holocaust in the making which will require the intervention of U.N. Migrant Council headed by Peter Sutherland. Already in 2009, the Mexican city of Juarez called for U.N. peacekeepers to help them with the violence from drug cartels along the border. While that hasn't happened yet, the idea of calling for U.N. intervention on the U.S.-Mexico border should send shockwaves through everyone watching. How much more calls will there be for U.N. intervention as the humanitarian crisis over children showing up unaccompanied on the border on the top of the larger illegal immigration issue be as this goes on, as Obama and other people make it seem worse and worse and worse? It's a manufactured crisis, but they know how to pull heartstrings and play propaganda. Consider this from a scholarly article bringing human rights into the migration and development debate, which analyzes how the UN Global Forum on Migration and Development, headed by Peter Sutherland, the very figure we're discussing, are seeking to use international institutions, not just the UN body, but other NGOs working with migrants to establish standards and norms for global migration. They want to consider not illegal immigrants, but irregular residents and how they can give them a better way to fit in into the society. They want to move towards a global government of migration. It might well be desirable that there should be an international regime which is in some way tabulated in an international legislation of one kind or another. And they say that migration should be associated with international human rights and that they should be part of development. A related institution called the Migration Policy Institute that's headed by a number of high-level globalists from the United States, Mexico, Honduras, Guatemala, and other places in Latin America got together in May of 2013 to discuss the topic thinking regionally to compete globally leveraging migration and human capital in the U.S., Mexico, and Central America, and explicitly discussed the issue between the very countries we're dealing with today, El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, Mexico, and the U.S., and they discussed how the declining native population of the United States, the dropping birth rates, justified the migration, illegal and otherwise, from Mexico and Central America, and they discussed how the populations with higher birth rates further down towards the equator would basically replace the falling rates inside the U.S. and how they should adjust global norms and the rules of the game to accommodate them better because they are just players, human capital, in the larger globalized economy. It has nothing to do for these people who are setting global policy with national sovereignty or the best interest of American workers. It has to do with the resetting of global order. They want to rectify the developing countries with the richer countries for the benefit of the richest among us, the banking class who sit above this global system and have their hands in the pie of all the major U.S. corporations, the Fortune 100 and 500, and the relevant global political and financial institutions of the entire American hemisphere. Vice President, I was particularly pleased that you gave such a strong endorsement for the free trade agreement for all the Americans. I think it's absolutely essential for the strength of our economy. They want not just a North American union, but an entire union of the Americas. There's a number of organizations, including the Organization of American States, that overlay on top of one another 
They've already signed the agreements under George W. Bush, the agreements for the North American Union, and soon enough they will be merging Central America and South America with that as well. That's part of the whole purpose of the CAFTA agreements, the Central American Free Trade Agreements that go along with and harmonize with the North American Free Trade Agreements. Just consider the fact that they won't even use the term illegal immigrants in policy discussions. This is not just semantics, and it's not just the arguments of those fighting for workers' rights who are opposed to a nativism. This is about the philosophy of a larger, more important, and more powerful group of people. Look at the overt statements from Peter Sutherland, the head of UN Migration, the head of Goldman Sachs International, one of the most important members of the Bilderberg Group. He testified before a UK committee on migration policies, and it was covered in both the Daily Mail and the BBC. The BBC's headline is, EU should undermine national homogeny, says UN Migration Chief. And he talked about how it was a desirable goal, that immigration was both inevitable and desirable for economic growth, that he wanted to chip into native populations that still had their original country content, you know, native French, native British. Uh, he wanted more multiculturalism, as he calls it. He suggested that the UK's immigration policy has no basis in international law. They're formulating the path for the United Nations and other international bodies to trump individual nations immigration policies including the united states right now all the appropriate leaders are discussing policies back and forth and figuring out how they can share ideas and and help facilitate these difficult problems help supersede humanitarian crisis guaranteed there will be coordination between mexico and the u.s over what's happening right now with children from central america and the scope of it the end result of it will be international. Peter Sutherland said the future prosperity of many EU states depended on them becoming multicultural. He said migration was a crucial dynamic for economic growth, however difficult it is to explain to the populations of those particular states. Sutherland essentially told people, you through your representatives, your native country, you will not decide immigration policy. What will happen will be told to you by someone from Goldman Sachs, by someone from the United Nations, because that's what's best for everyone, and you just better understand. That's the takeaway message. He said, in fact, that precisely what's happened in the European Union, what it should be doing, the European Union project in general, is to undermine those native populations. He said more to the point that an aging and declining native populations in countries was the key argument for the development of multicultural states. So what's happening on a global scale? We've been told for a half century or more that we're overpopulated, that people should have less children by choice because we're running out of resources. We're not going to be able to sustain ourselves. Uh, of course, global people take control from that. Eugenics is in play. A lot of scaremongering. Al Gore carbon talk. And what they want is for people from these old line European countries in the U.S. to have less children. They are and they have been for more than a generation or two. Now they're going to move in migrants to take the jobs, mix into a multicultural society that only a corporate overlay could take care of. Because old line nativistic societies, which had a lot of flaws, there was evidence of discrimination, there was a lot of oligopoly in play, still took care of themselves and had a continuity of family with an entire culture that was powerful and resisted intervention from bankers who've been willing away at countries over the centuries. But the chess pieces are in place. Something bigger is happening now in this century. As the populations of the most prosperous countries in the world, the United States and Europe, are dwindling. As those native populations are dying out, they're moving in cheap labor and cheap replacement from countries that can't defend themselves and are just going to be pawns for the global takeover. That's what's really happening. And it's happening there too. Mexico's population is starting to age and decline. They've already said that Mexico will begin to receive immigrants 
from Central America, probably South America as well. And sooner or later, those countries will be paved over with the New World Order corporate overlay as well. Walmart will have ruled the day. Goldman Sachs will be backing every major loan. Chase Manhattan Bank and JP Morgan will own all the pieces on the table. And Monsanto and their biotech friends will be telling every country in the world from Africa to Latin America and good old US of A how to grow their crops and uh, whether or not they can grow anything else at all or be sued in court for it. There's something going on here and it has nothing to do with whether or not you like brown people taking your jobs or living next to you in the barrios and slum conditions or whether or not you feel comfortable taking food stamps since you don't have as good a job as you used to. It's all happening on a grander scale. It's being put together. It's been happening already in Europe for those in America who haven't traveled to Europe, who haven't seen it. You go to France. I went to Paris. <laughs> It doesn't look like the Paris of fairy tales and of history. It looks like one big Islamic slum where a bunch of immigrant workers are just getting by and the old population's dying out. France hasn't been replacing itself for a little while. The UK now is overrun by Polish immigrants. They're receiving now African immigrants. They're also receiving Islamic immigrants. And in the U.S. sector, on the other side of the ocean, it's Hispanic and Latin American immigrants. People from different parts of the world, good people, hardworking people. Now, people from other places are interesting. The point of this discussion is who is running the show, who's making these decisions, and who's moving the chess pieces. They're making these policies happen. Defending our freedoms is the most essential part of what it means to be an American who respects the Constitution and Bill of Rights and wants something better for people from other parts. We used to be a lamp of liberty, a shining beacon to other parts of the world. But now we've been reduced and taken over because Wall Street, the bankers, the Bilderbergers, the political globalists have tricked us, have divided us amongst ourselves and the others that we now live with. And they've told us that NAFTA is going to be free trade, that globalization and the World Trade Organization, that those are freedom, that that opens up borders and opens up new possibilities. They're preaching a philosophy of free movement. Yes, there is a fear of globalization. There seems to be an attempt to disconnect the concept of economic globalization with the advantages that free movement of goods and services brings to all of us. The economic globalization of removing borders, GATT, WTO, the European Union and so on, that's why it's vital. But it's not so that people can be free, it's so that they can exploit who they want, when they want, where they want. There's actually a lot of good common sense with tariffs and borders and border protection. Our border patrol has not been allowed to do their job for well over a decade. Reagan, the Republican, passed amnesty in 86. They claimed it was going to stop the illegal immigration. Of course it didn't. They claimed NAFTA was going to stop the illegal immigration. Of course it didn't. They claimed CAFTA was going to improve things for Central America and head off that wave. How's that working out for you? What's happening right now at our borders? Why are we facing this crisis? It's because of these larger globalist tendencies, and it's because those in political power want to wring us, pull our heartstrings, and trick us into this amnesty so they can get even more power and delude what America once was and what free people once stood for. Don't fall for it. See through it, but go deep into the picture. Figure out what's really going on. Don't hate on someone from another side of a border or with a different skin color. Realize that we're all being exploited and we're about to lose everything. I said, well, how does it stop being disruptive? And that is when their jobs come up from a dollar an hour to six dollars an hour and ours go down to six dollars an hour, then it's leveled again. But in the meantime, you've wrecked the country with these kinds of deals. You've wrecked the country with these kinds of deals.